Okay, I'm back, still talking about the conference. You really shouldn't be watching these unless you've had your conference, but it's a little review. In the conference, I also spoke about this diagram, and I made an argument about melting point. And I spoke about the melting point of the eutectic and what we said was every sample, every sample that is not pure begins melting at the eutectic temperature. So when a sample starts melting, right, as you go from whatever the room temperature is up to the eutectic temperature, and we think the eutectic temperature is about 80 for this sample, the sample is just increasing in kinetic energy, but when it gets to the eutectic temperature, it starts to melt, okay? So what we talked about in the conference was we talked about the fact that a sample that is 99 to 1 really has the broadest melting point, but you just don't see it. So what I did was I drew a little diagram and I said, this is going to be a little briefer than what I did in the conference, but I had a solid and I had a liquid, Okay, and I said, supposing you had a solid that was almost all acid aniline with just a little tiny bit of salicylic acid in it, in it, and you get to that eutectic temperature and it starts melting. And I said, supposing that sample melts in a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay, now this one-to-one -one ratio is made up. It's kind of ridiculous. It's what I did in class. Okay, this is the solid. This is the liquid. This is the interface. Okay. What I what the eutectic temperature represents is the temperature at which you're making a solution of A and the contaminant, salicylic acid. I want you to think of A as the solvent and salicylic acid as the solute. Okay, and again, it would probably require many more A molecules to dissolve up the salicylic acid. So when you hit this temperature, this eutectic temperature, which we think is around 80 for the sample the sample will start to melt. And melting involves forming a solution, and we are arbitrarily saying it's a one-to-one -one solution. Okay, so what I would expect is that the A would melt and form a solution, this is the liquid phase, that was 50% A and 50% salicylic acid. Okay, again, I made up this one-to-one -one ratio. And I just want you to think about why is it with a 99% sample, even though it starts melting there and it starts making the solution, and it's the same solution you would make for an 8515, that you don't see it. You just can't see it. And what many students said during the conference is that you can't see this amount of compound. In other words, if you have more contaminant, you make more eutectic. The eutectic is all the same, but you make more eutectic. If you only have 1% of contaminant, the point is you really can, cannot see 2% of the sample. A human being can't see it. But on the other hand, if the contaminant was, say, 15%, you wouldn't have much trouble seeing 30% of the sample. That's kind of extreme and exaggerated, but I hope it gets the point across. The other thing we spoke about was the fact that if you have an A molecule come over, that's what you need to keep it melting, right? We want to move above the eutectic temperature. To keep it melting, you want to have another A molecule come over. I had students think about the fact that another A molecule coming over changes this ratio from 50-50 to 67-33 approximately, A to salicylic acid. And you should think about that. It goes from 50-50 to 67-33 with one molecule. That means that the percentage of A at the interface changes considerably, and that means that the rate of equilibrium has to go up proportionately to maintain the equilibrium. The rate of exchange has to go way up. It has to go from 50% A at the interface to 67% at the interface. And we were talking about how that takes a big delta T to do that, a larger delta T than if we had more contaminant. So that's something I want you to think about a little bit, okay? So this is just a little review. It's optional. I hope it helped a little bit. Bye-bye.